recording. Uh, and then we'll wait like half a minute more just for people to actually come in now. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll, we'll get started in just about a minute. All right, um, so we can get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending uh, this evening's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Uh, before we begin, just a few notes. Um, please let me know if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve. You can send those to me in the chat. And then if you have any questions or comments, you can send them via the Q and A. Um, and this program was made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation and the Lexington, Lexington Historical Society, who we've partnered with for this event. And now from the Historical Society, here is Sarah McDonough to say a few words. Thanks, Matt. Um, we are just so delighted that the library and the Historical Society have continued to have a great working partnership over the past year. And we're so excited that you guys continue to have so many amazing historically based programs. So hopefully many of our folks will be here tonight um, to see this wonderful presentation, um, having seen our speaker before. And hopefully you will join us again next month on February 17th for Racism and Civil Rights, a Historical Perspective. And you can go to either carrylibrary.org or lexingtonhistory.org to get more information about that. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and now I'd like to introduce David Crew. David has written a number of local history books on including Building Route 128 and several books on Scale Square, as well as movie scripts and articles in The Globe and Boston Herald. Uh, most importantly for tonight, David was a webmaster and spokesperson for The Big Dig. So now, please welcome David. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you both to the Library and the Historical Society for having me tonight. When we're going to talk about The Big Dig, um, and as uh, was said, I was a spokesperson for several years during the 1990s as a spokesperson for The Big Dig. And as proof of that, at risk to my dignity, I present this picture of me at one of our uh, field press events. Uh, and before you ask, no, I did not work with a sailor, a policeman, and a Native American. What we're going to talk about tonight, and one of the reasons that I wanted to do this show was a frustration that I had. And by the way, this was a really cool job. I got to wear a hard hat and go down into the construction sites. Um, but one of the things about working uh, for a public works project was the need to do a lot of sound bites in order to get things into the newspaper onto TV. You had to be very quick and everything had to be about how great the project was. And I always felt while we did a really good job describing the how of this thing getting built, we didn't do a very good job of explaining the why. And that's what the first half of tonight's presentation is because we need to talk about how did Boston get to the point where we really did need a big dig. So we start all the way back in 1630 when Boston was first founded by the 30 settlers led by John Winthrop who came over here to the mainland to the Shoman Peninsula named after the Native Americans who lived here seeking fresh water. Now you'll notice that this peninsula is barely connected to the rest of Massachusetts by that little neck, which when the tide was high and the tide was in such a position, it was often flooded. And so entrepreneurs, private businessmen began to run ferries across various bodies of water. And that's a theme you're going to notice a lot tonight, that the idea of big, expensive, 
publicly funded public works projects would be centuries in the future. Back then, and for a couple of hundred years in, in, uh, later, it would be business people who would take care of the uh, infrastructure and transportation needs of the city by doing things like running ferries. Ferries, unfortunately, took time to load and unload. They were expensive, and of course, they were uh, highly susceptible to the weather. In 1720, there was a town meeting to consider building a bridge, but they debated over funding and siting. And so in 1795, a privately funded toll bridge was built here across the Charles River. This bridge was a wild success. The businessmen who funded it made a ton of dough. And so, as naturally happens, when one person is successful, others follow. In 1805, another bridge was built, this one across to South Boston, which afforded such a great view of the growing city that pedestrians would pay money just to walk across it and to get a view of the city. Traffic across that initial Charles River Bridge was so heavy that the West Boston Bridge was built in 1809. And now it's 1810. And we can see from this map, this is the famous John Bonner map of the 17, early 1700s, that this, excuse me, this is the 16, uh, 1769 map. Boston is running out of room. The North End and the town center are crowded. Boston Common has been decreed out of bounds to developers. But as it happens, there are three hills in Boston known collectively as the Tri Mountains, which, by the way, is where we get the name for Tremont Street. We have Mount Vernon, we have Beacon Hill, and we have Pemberton Hill. In 1799, a private businessman leveled Mount Vernon. It was far too steep to build on anyway. He leveled it off, built some houses, sold them at a profit. The dirt was used to fill and extend Charles Street. And then in 1824, the mill pond, which had been formed when some other entrepreneurs built a dam across it a few years earlier. And by the way, they built into the dam a mill, that's why it was called the mill pond, and run by the tide action, they would grind wheat and corn, and they made a very nice profit. But by 1824, uh, it had uh, started to get a little gamey in this little mill pond, so they filled it in, and they built a section of the city known as the Bullfinch Triangle because it was designed by Charles Bullfinch. The area where the dirt was, it became Beacon Hill, and it's where the state house would be built. Now it's 1832, and a guy named Patrick Tracy Jackson, one of the founders of the textile mills up in Lowell, he needs to build a railroad station to ship and receive goods from his mills. So he takes the last of the top of the Tri Mountains, Cotton Hill, and he fills in new land around Causeway Street, Causeway because it was a causeway built over that old mill dam for the rail terminus. Now, meanwhile, he takes the land that's now flat where the dirt came from and he constructs a new neighborhood called Pemberton Square where Boston's elite lived for many decades. The biggest change to happen in Boston during this decade, the 1830s and then the 1840s, would be the railroad as built as they would be extended from Lawrence, Lowell, up from Plymouth, from Providence, and then extending further out west. More railroad stations were built, businesses to support trade and commerce, and employment soared here in Boston. The biggest change came from the Boston and Worcester Railroad, which had been running across another dam, uh, which, to, well, here's a funny story. Uh, the dam they wanted to build back in the uh, early 1800s had been opposed by what we could call early environmentalists because they claimed there was not enough tidal action across that area to 
completely flush out that little uh, swampy area on the left side of that red line. Well, to show you how little things have changed in Massachusetts, it took the legislature late at night, where only about a fifth of their members were in attendance, to approve the, uh, own, the business people giving them the license to build that mill dam. Well, the dam turned out to be a financial failure, and it also turned out the environmentalists were right. And by the late 1840s, that swampy area literally bubbled with fermenting raw sewage. It was a 580-acre toilet. There was a swamp. And so a bunch of other folks got together and they put together a privately financed plan to fill in this section of the city, which was known as the Back Bay. This privately financed corporation would not only end up funding the Massachusetts School Fund, but several museums and colleges, including Tufts and Williams College. It was the big dig of its day. It was a massive urban renewal project, which began in 1858. The first thing they needed to do was find a source of dirt and gravel because, well, the Tri Mountains had already been taken down and there really wasn't enough land close to Boston. Well, they found this brilliant site here at the Newton Needham town line. There was just mountains of this gravel that was perfect for fill. So using two new inventions of the era, one the steam shovel and two the steam locomotive, three trains of 35 cars each made 16 trips every 24 hours for almost 30 years. When they were done, they took that fetid swamp and they turned it into one of America's great neighborhoods. This new photograph showing the Back Bay in 1882 What's really interesting about this project is that Boston knew exactly what the area would look like because the plan had been laid out even before the fill-in had begun. So things are going along great. Boston has its new back bay. In 1887, so many people were making their way through Boston. The economy was just humming that the streets, the street tracks, the streetcar tracks were electrified and electric trolleys were introduced into Boston. But the traffic was so bad between the electric trolleys, the horse drawn carts, the horse drawn uh, uh, stagecoaches, omnibuses, and so on. It was actually written in uh, the Boston Post of 1895 that it could take you one hour to go one block through downtown Boston? The answer was incredibly clever, was to, in 1895, build America's first subway system. It was our second big dig. What you're seeing here is an example of what the engineers call cut and cover construction. So what you do is you take a section of, of tunnel. In this case, it's about 300 feet. You route your traffic around this cut, you dig into the ground, you build your infrastructure, your subway, your highway, whatever. Then you cover it back up and you move down another 300 feet and you repeat the process. When they were done in 1897, they had completed the first part of what would be, again, America's first subway system. And this thing worked great. I mean, more and more people could make their way through the city. People could now live further away from the center of town. They could commute into the city on these beautiful electric trolleys. And then some darn fool had to go and invent the automobile. And that caused so much traffic, made even worse by the fact that outside of the city, there was no circumferential highway. Those of you who've seen my Route 128 presentation know that tale. Since everything was radial going into the city, that's the re main reason why the city was so crowded. Because if you were in Maine and wanted to go to the Cape or on the Cape and wanted to go up north, you had to go through the city. So things got so bad that in 1909, 
a special city commission recommended building a 100 foot wide roadway above the street with a rail tunnel linking North and South stations. Now, to show you how little things have changed in Boston, there were so many arguments over siting and funding that the thing never got built. They did manage a major widening of some of the big roadways through Boston, such as Cambridge Street, as we can see here. And this project was done in the mid to late 1920s. Now, it didn't eliminate the traffic jams. It frankly only made them wider. But the 1920s saw a booming American economy, more and more cars making, way, making their way through the city. It got so bad that in 1930, city planners proposed a dramatic and innovative idea. It was <clears throat> to build this 100-foot uh, wide elevated highway between north and south. Yeah, well, a thousand businesses and residents would have to be taken, but that's not why it didn't get done. There was a thing called the Great Depression, and then there was another thing called World War II. A uh, few things managed to get built. Sumner Tunnel opened in 1934, and it was a smashing success. But of course, it always put more cars on the street. It's the if you build it, they will come problem. Now it's after World War II. The city is not in great shape. There is this terrific exodus to the suburbs as America uh, enjoys a prosperity unparalleled in human history. And as People move out to the suburbs, taking their automobiles with them. Boston is described by one major national newspaper as a city that is dying on the vine. Thanks to James Michael Curley's fourth and thankfully last administration, there were a lot of tax abatements, not a lot of tax revenue coming in, no dollars for maintaining infrastructure, roads, safety services. But in 1948, the Federal Housing Act was passed and it called for slum clearance. And now I'll do one of my two presidential impressions because the question became, what's the definition of a slum? Well, a slum, frankly, is whatever neighborhood doesn't have the political clout not to be called a slum. And so it was the West End of Boston, its most crowded and once politically active ward that unfortunately got the label of being a slum. Herbert Gans, the great uh, uh, chronicler of the story of the West End said the neighborhood may have been crowded and lacking in amenities, but it basically was a good place to live and 12,000 West Enders would have agreed. It was an unmitigated urban renewal disaster. Most former residents who were too poor ended up in more expensive housing that taxed their resources to the limit and I'm telling you the West End story because it's going to have a tremendous impact on the way that the Central Artery Tunnel Project would operate. John Collins gets elected mayor in 1959 and he hires a city planner named Ed Logue who engineers a $40 million federal uh, uh, project for raising Scully Square and building government center. Now, unlike the West End disaster, there were few residents in Scully Square, so the project was pretty well received, despite what had happened in the West End. Then Collins proceeded with a plan to turn the Back Bay Rail Yard into the Prudential Center, as well as the South End Streets project and other jobs. But traffic was still a problem. In 1948, there was something called the McGuire Plan. And in this plan, they proposed an innovative solution to the problem of traffic here in Boston. You guessed it. Let's build an elevated artery between North and South Station. Now, government, private businesses, they were all four square behind the project. The ones who didn't like it were the North Enders because it was going to take 1,000 homes and businesses. So there were lots of arguments on where this new highway would be sited. Many North Enders had suggested they build the highway closer to the waterfront. But the idea was rejected because it would not achieve the main goal of the project, which was to bring people into the city, not through them. So with state funding 
and a new mayor, John Hines, it was decided to finally build that elevated highway. And so large part of the North End, Boston's oldest neighborhood was literally wiped off the face of the map and replaced with this elevated highway. 20,000 people would eventually lose their homes to this six lane elevated highway in the sky. In 1954, the highway was opened up here to this point, the Fort Hill section. By this point, Boston had learned a few things about this elevated highway. First, that it was really ugly. Uh, it turned out to be this terrible barrier between neighborhoods. The land underneath it was not very useful. It was only good for parking and muggings. And traffic flow up on the artery was confusing and inefficient. And there were actually discussions about whether or not they would even finish the job. Now, it was agreed we would finish the job, but then the question of what the southern part of the route would be came into question. Boston Post cartoonist Francis Dahl had some fun with the question as city planners begged their founder, the, the mythical cow that laid out our streets, where do we put this highway? In late 1954, it was decided to send the elevated highway through Chinatown and the Leather District. But Chinatown, with the help from businesses and some city activists, stopped the concrete onslaught. And instead of an elevated highway, they got the city, the state, to build it underground. So in 1946, the Dewey Square or South Station Tunnel was built. Here you see using the cut and cover method. Now, it still required the removal of buildings and streets. It left a wide boulevard that split Chinatown proper from that leather district. But it was the beginning of a new way to look at highway projects. Now, the Artery to Braintree was opened on July 1st, 1959. This was the ceremony held just a few days earlier. What's interesting and prophetic is that on June 30th, the old Colony Railroad was shut down. We had made our choice. It was the highway or no way to get into the city. The highway was designed to handle uh, about uh, 75, uh, 50,000, excuse me, 50,000 vehicles a day. However, they built 27 on and off ramps, which they felt at the time were essential, not only to prevent traffic from overwhelming su surface streets, but also to ensure that people could get off this highway and make it to downtown. Again, that was one of the goals of the artery. But unfortunately, some knucklehead decided to put the on-ramps, excuse me, the off-ramps before or just after the on-ramps, leading to these weaves that some of you are old enough to remember that old elevated artery. Um, also, because the project was entirely funded by the state, they didn't have the money for either land taking or construction that would allow for breakdown lanes. Now in 1959, the artery was seeing about 75,000 vehicles a day. Let me ask you, what are the odds that at least one car or truck every day is going to break down at some point during the rush hour? So the DPW had a great solution. You guessed it, it was to build more highways. This is a representation of what is called the Witten Plan. Again, those of you who've seen my Route 128 presentation know all about this. It's the regional spoken wheel system originally planned for Boston. It includes the Southeast Expressway, I-95 south of the city, Mass Turnpike, a completed Route 2, I-93 and I-95 north of the city. But this was the 60s and some interesting things were happening. And we talked about Chinatown getting the state to put the highway underground through their neighborhood. We've talked about the West End and the pushback that the government was now receiving when it 
knocked on the door, as the old joke goes, and says, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. Not so fast. It's also a time of growing interest in the environment. And one by one, these highways that had been deemed essential by the traffic planners were eliminated from the plan. One of the major victories for the community activists was the removal of the hub itself, something that was called the inner beltway, which was to be an eight lane elevated highway that would have taken another 25,000 uh, people, put another 25,000 people out of their homes. Well, this is probably good for the environment, but it did cause some problems here in Boston. We're looking at the area near North Station, the area known as the Leverett Connection. So without the inner beltway, the central artery not only got traffic going into the city, but through it. The Mass Turnpike extension would connect to the southern end of the artery, and I-93 completed in 1973 would connect to the central artery, creating, creating the infamous three-lane weave to and from the Starro Drive. What fun we had. Those of us who came up 93, who wanted to go either to 93 or to the Tobin Bridge, or those folks coming from Starro Drive who needed to cross three lanes of traffic within 300 feet in order to get to the bridge. It was known as one of the worst bottlenecks in the state. And I don't have documentation, but I do believe this is where the expression mass hole came from. Okay, so here we are. We have an artery that was built for about 50,000 cars. It's handling about 190,000 as we move into the 70s. There's bumper to bumper traffic for six to eight hours a day. The projection was 15 to 16 hour traffic jams by 2010 and an accident rate four times the national average for an urban interstate. It was deteriorating, it was ugly. So there need to be some fixes. Uh, one proposal was a third harbor tunnel to bleed traffic from the south, but well, you got people in East Boston who are not so happy about the idea of more traffic being dumped into Maverick Square. Let's not forget those folks in East Boston and those mothers who lay down in front of bulldozers to prevent the airport from building that new runway, which they only just did a few years ago. So the Leverett Connector was another idea to directly connect the Tobin Bridge to Starro Drive. That would have fixed that weave, but the project was killed by John Sears and the Beacon Hill, uh, uh, Beacon Hill folks. There were proposals for a second deck on the artery, if you can believe that. Arcades and stores below, new ramps to East Boston tunnels. It, it was all rejected. You couldn't widen it. It was too expensive and it was impossible after what happened in Chinatown, after what happened in the West End, after what was happening all over the country, it was impossible for you to take any homes or businesses. And then in the 1970s, there was an idea for this tunnel. A guy named Fred Salvucci, he was Secretary of Transportation under Mike Dukakis. And uh, he had a friend who worked for the DPW, a fellow named Bill Reynolds, and together they had an idea to replace the existing roadway with a tunnel, which would alleviate, alleviate the traffic congestions and reconnect the city with its waterfront. But look, you can't shut the city down. But this Bill Reynolds fellow said it was possible, and they actually came up with a, a, a plan to do that. But it was going to be expensive. And get ready, folks. It was going to cost a whole $300 million, stop laughing, $300 million to build this new uh, project. But the real problem was that not a single dollar of this highway, this, this artery depression, as some were calling it, would be qualified for federal funds. In fact, Barney Frank, who was then a state rep, said, wouldn't it be easier and cheaper just to raise the city than lower the artery? 
by the way, in all fairness, depression was only for the section between Dewey Square and Government Center. And much of it would be like the Turnpike extension is today. Not really a tunnel. Uh, it's what call, they call a boat section. So it was a depressed piece of roadway with occasional bridges across it. So you didn't need ventilation and it was a lot cheaper to build. In 1992, um, 1982, excuse me. Um, I'm sorry, let's back up. So a lot of folks want to know why then, if we had the idea for the Central Artery Project in the 70s, why it took until really the 1990s before any work actually got done. I'm going to show you why. Okay, so Dukakis, his guide, Salvucci, along with Bill Reynolds, they come up with this idea for depressing the central artery. Well, they didn't want a third harbor tunnel. They just wanted to uh, depress, I'm sorry, in 1978, let's back up, and it gets confusing, and see, even I get confused sometimes. So you got Dukakis in office in 74, and they, they want to build this depressed artery. In 1978, a guy named Ed King, who used to be head of Massport, he wins the governor's office. Now, Ed King, he loved the idea of building a third harbor tunnel because he was a Massport guy and he wanted to see more traffic into the airport. Ed King did not want to build this central artery project. He just wanted to build his third harbor tunnel. So all the attention and all the design work then shifted from downtown Boston to this third harbor tunnel. Well, those of you old enough to remember what happened in 1982, Mike Dukakis beats Ed King and gets back into office. And you know what? Yeah, uh, Mike Dukakis doesn't want to build a third harbor tunnel. Mike Dukakis wants to depress the central artery. Well, Dukakis brings back Salvucci. Salvucci brings back his pal, Bill Reynolds, and they say to Mike Dukakis, you know what? We can do it all. We can do a third harbor tunnel. We can depress the central artery. Well, it's now 1982 and the labor unions, they love the jobs. The environmentalists, they love the idea of all this green space. They also love the idea that the project's budget would include a rail link, remember the rail link, between North and South Station. The neighborhoods love the commitment not to take any homes or businesses. Again, let's remember the West End. The businesses, they love the commitment to keep every road operating until its replacement or temporary fix was in place. And Bill Reynolds, he's the guy who came up with a remarkably simple route for the tunnel to Logan one that didn't require going up Fort Point Channel and didn't require having to go through downtown East Boston. Because if you're gonna go to the airport, why not just bring the traffic into the airport? And that's why that third harbor tunnel goes under the harbor from Southie rather than through Eastie. Well, the Federal Highway Administration agreed to funding and an EIS, that's the Environmental Impact Statement, which is basically a contract between the state and the feds. By the way, that's the document that says, we promise to never take a single home or business to build this project. So they come up with a price tag of $2.5 billion, and that's a figure that would come to haunt everyone associated with the job. So the funding bill goes to the Senate, where a funny thing happens. Um, they, first of all, uh, it goes to, um, to Reagan because the funding bill passed, but it passed by a bare majority goes to Ronald Reagan's desk and he issues one of the, a veto with one of the great quotes from the Reagan administration. And here comes my other presidential impression. <laughs> the Gipper says, 
I haven't seen this much pork since I handed out blue ribbons at the Iowa County Fair. So it goes back to the Senate. All you physics, uh, civics majors, remember, now you need a two thirds majority to get this thing through the Senate. And one by one, Tip O'Neill and Ted Kennedy, they start twisting some arms and they get this uh, senator from North Carolina, Terry Sanford. They get him into the old cloakroom. They say, tell you what, Terry, old boy, you vote for our highway project and we'll vote for your tobacco subsidies. And now you had 67 votes. You had the override. And now the project is funded. The state makes one really good decision uh, at this point in the project, and they realize they're not up to this task. It's, it's going to be too monumental. They need to bring in experts. And they find two of the biggest construction companies in the world, the Bechtel Company and Parsons Brinkerhoff, who were selected as joint managers of the project in 1986. Well, let's see, we started in 1630. It is now 1986, and now we can start to build. Again, one of the driving forces behind the project's construction, and as you will see, one of the things that really helps drive up the cost of this project will be this contract, this EIS document, which vows to mitigate and by the way, that's a word I never knew until I started working at the project. And I had to look it up. And it actually means to make less painful. And that's what mitigation was or is. It was about making the impact on the city as minimal as possible. So there was a lot of work to be done in downtown Boston. Mapping and moving utility cables, pipes, wires had to be routed over and under where this new tunnel was going to go. It would not be very sporting of the big dig to knock out the power and lose water to half the city. So while they're doing all this mapping, they realize they can get a jump on the project by building this third harbor tunnel. Um, so they start digging a trench between South Boston and Logan Airport. Because instead of building this tunnel in bedrock, they would save a ton of dough by building these prefabricated, these binocular shaped uh, tubes, each about as long as a, a football field. You see two uh, tubes, one will go north and one will go south. And they were built in a Baltimore shipyard. Again, you got to spread that big, big money around a bit. And it was barged up here to Boston. And then using these catamarans, satellites and laser beams, and they lowered one by one these tunnel sections into a trench that was dug between Southie and Logan Airport. Hydrostatic pressure would push the sections together and seal them tight. Um, now I'll tell you a funny story, a little inside story from uh, my days as a spokesperson. So uh, it's 1994 and we are talking to people about how this tunnel is being built and this, these, how we're lowering these sections of tunnel and the project manager, this the uh, uh, PE, uh, the project engineer, uh, for this particular uh, part of the construction job, which is lowering these sections. He's telling us, yeah, well, you know, each at the end of each of these tubes, you have these rubber seals, they're O-rings. And the O-rings cause us a, a connection between the two sections. And I said, Ho hold on a second. <laughs> so uh, like, do you remember uh, like what happened like just to, like six years ago down at Cape Canaveral with something called an O-ring? Can we not mention the O-rings when we're talking about a tunnel that's supposed to carry thousands of people a day? The Ted Williams Tunnel uh, was a three quarter mile section underwater. And then both on the East Boston and the South Boston side, land based entrance ramps were being built. Meanwhile, in the tunnel, before it even got connected to land, thousand foot foot excuse me, thousand pound ceiling tiles were installed. Why were the ceiling tiles so heavy? Because fresh air was going to be pumped in through the floor 
and the exhaust pulled out through the ceiling tiles. And those, that air was going to be moving at uh, almost 60 miles an hour. So they had to be really heavy not to get this large. The Ted Williams Tunnel in total is about 1.6 miles long. There were two vent buildings, one on Logan Airport side with 14 exhaust, 10 supply vans, fans, South Boston side, had a computerized traffic monitoring system, closed circuit television, emergency response station, so that should anybody get stuck in the tunnel, they could get them out as quickly as possible and reduce impacts and uh, hopefully keep traffic tie-ups. December 15th, 1995 was a pretty big day because it was the first real major piece of the Big Dig project that was finally gonna be open to the public. Pretty cool day for me too, because as a huge baseball fan, I got to meet Ted Williams and other baseball stars as the project, uh, major part of this project was open. <clears throat> and this is a great picture. Um, I, 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 there's Ted Williams, by the way, you know, Ted didn't even wear a tie when he went to the White House. So when they brought him to the project and I saw he was dressed like a homeless guy, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. But it really was it really was a terrific day. And there's uh, Bill Weld applauding as uh, as Ted touches the plaque, which bears his name and his likeness. <clears throat> now I'll let you in on another little secret. So by 1994, 1995, that $2.5 billion had now grown to about $7.7 .7 billion. And again, to be fair, you have a different scope. You have the project getting bigger in many regards, and we're gonna talk about why it got bigger shortly. Technical challenges that needed to be overcome. But what they did was um, a little bit of, um, let's say, um, accounting ledger domain. So up here at Logan Airport, as part of the Big Dig's original plan was a new set of ramps that would lead to and from the airport and connect the Ted Williams Tunnel to Route 1A. But as the scope of the Big Dig got bigger and the scope of the Logan Airport project got bigger, they took that money or monies that was scheduled and budgeted for Logan and they moved it over to the Massport Ledger. So Bob's your uncle, now you have a project that stays comfortably under the $7.7 .7 billion limit, at least for now. Meanwhile, on the South Boston side of the harbor, the Ted Williams Tunnel, which exited shortly after it came out uh, from under the harbor for, for temporarily, had to be extended through South Boston. Um, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember when South Boston was a bunch of rail yards, parking lots, and the Channel nightclub, but that was pretty much it for what was happening in that part of the city. And now it's almost a city unto itself. And that's directly attributable to the infrastructure and the highway system that was begun here uh, in the 1990s. Okay, so, uh, and to be serious and um, uh, about why did the project cost go up? And right here is a microcosm for the answer to that question. What we're seeing here is the connection between Route 90, the Mass Turnpike, the Southeast Expressway, and the Central Artery. This basically, as it was described to me by one of the designers, is a cloverleaf. Think of a cloverleaf like we have in, up here by Route 93 and Route 128. And that's a, a normal, although it's now with cars traveling so fast, a fairly outdated way to connect two major roads. But that's basically the way most connections of roads that cross are built. But here, you basically are folding over three of those four quadrants onto each other. The way it was described to me, it's like folding an omelet four times. So all four quadrants of that cloverleaf, because 
in one part you have well you have the south end streets where the boston herald is located not a good idea to force a a one of the city's two newspapers out from their home you have the south station located in another quadrant and you had uh, the postal annex and Fort Point Channel in the other quadrant. So how do you connect all of these pieces together? Well, the original idea was to take this Route 90, this uh, highway from Logan Airport and bring it over the Fort Point Channel, over the Southeast Expressway and down into the Mass Turnpike Cut. Well, they ran into some resistance and the resistance came from, if you look in the bottom right hand corner of this drawing, Gillette headquarters. When you have one of the largest employers of the state saying, if you put a highway in, if you block our view of downtown Boston, and by the way, take all most of our parking lot, we may have to find another place to build our razors. So the engineers, they went back to the drawing board and they came up with a new way to make this connection. But that sound you are hearing is the sound of the cash register ringing. What they were going to do is to take the highway and put it underground, keep it underground here in South Boston. Well, that meant that you now had to build one more vent building because the whole structure was going to be underground. Furthermore, you had to cross Fort Point Channel in the water. Let me tell you something about Fort Point Channel. Because so many businesses, factories were lining Fort Point Channel for hundreds of years and allowed to spill all of their toxic waste into this water, this thing was a pretty bad stew of chemicals. So environmentally, you had to really be careful not to stir any of that nasty stuff up. Oh, and, and running right down the middle of Fort Point Channel is the red line. You don't want to break the red line, but you still have to build this thing basically underwater. Then you have to connect up with an underground artery and then with a surface Southeast Expressway and then the Mass Turnpike. And you have to do that all around one of the busiest sections of the city. Um, whoop, a little too fast. So some of the innovation, and you know, I'll admit, every time you hear me use the word innovation, the cash register is going to ring. But this is pretty cool. What they did, because they couldn't build those tunnel sections like they built the Ted Williams tunnel and float them up the Fort Point Channel, because again, you had the red line, the Fort Point Channel was much too shallow for that sort of thing. What they did was they built this casting basin here in South Boston. Uh, they asked the forbearance of the Gillette Company for about 10 years while they did a whole bunch of work and uh, they agreed. They built this casting basin and in the casting basin, they would build tunnel sections. As the tunnel sections were completed, they would breach this coffer dam and they would float the tunnel sections into the, into the Fort Point Channel. And there they would rest them on pilings that had been set carefully underneath the channel. When the job was done, and this to me is so clever, it's a great example of recycling. When this, these tunnel sections were finally laid across the Fort Point Channel or under the Fort Point Channel, they took the casting basin and simply used it as the last remaining piece of the mass turnpike to Logan Airport. Here we see the vent building that will be needed to pump fresh air into the Ted Williams Tunnel Extension. And we also see another source of challenges for our designers, because there you have, you have the railroad tracks coming from behind South Station. 
And again, let's go back to that EIS. You are not allowed to take a single piece, a single lane of highway or a single track of train while you're building this project. So how do you build a highway underneath an active railroad? Well, we borrowed a bit of technology from the British who had come up with this idea called tunnel jacking. It's actually very clever. You um, build a trench next to your railroad tracks, and then you build your tunnel section here in this trench, and then a massively powerful hydraulic jack pushes or jacks your tunnel underneath the active railroad. Inside you have little conveyor belts and diggers and you have workers and they're putting dirt from underneath these railroads on the conveyor belt going out, being picked off by the, uh, by cement, by uh, refuse trucks. And th this, is, this is actually a picture of a tunnel section that is in the process of being jacked underneath the active railroad, which you can see. Well, that's pretty cool, right? You know, uh, the tunnels, actually the trains, uh, the tunnel sections moved about 20 feet below the tracks at a rate of about three to six feet per day under normal circumstances. But this is Boston and nothing is normal because the part of Boston where South Station was built and where this highway is being built, as one engineer described it to me, this soil had the consistency of weak old tapioca. I'm not a civil engineer, but you can't build highways in weak old tapioca. So what are you gonna do? Well, normally, if you didn't have eight tra tracks of uh, running over your property, you would use a method called uh, tile, a tunnel, uh, grout, tile grouting, excuse me, grout mixing, grout mixing. Um, grout mixing is basically, it's like big old mixers and into the ground, you mix in grout. You all, anyone who's worked on their kitchen or their bath tiling knows what that stuff is. It would stiffen the soil and when it hardens, you can then dig into the soil. But you can't use that. There's no room for the equipment and the soil even if there weren't those railroad tracks, was really not very well receptive to uh, grout mixing. So they came up with this idea of, of putting hundreds of pipes, driving them into the ground, in between the tracks even, building a freezing plant to pump this ice cold brine into the pipes, into the ground, freezing the ground, so that the tunnels could be jacked, so the tunnel could be built. Did you hear the cash register ringing? Because what originally had been budgeted for about $400 million, now with all the things I just described, plus other mitigation efforts that had to be made as neighborhoods started to grow and get even more active, you're talking about a three to four billion dollar crossing just here in this lower part of the project. So now we come to the heart, no pun intended, of the Central Artery Tunnel Project. Now the work that's being performed downtown to replace the six lane artery with an eight lane tunnel is absolutely amazing even made more amazing by the fact that, again, that EIS, you're not allowed to disrupt any businesses, take any lanes of highway, and you have a city with long memories. The debacle of the West End, the near annihilation of several Boston neighborhoods with the inner beltway, not to mention the destruction of a huge swath of the North End, for the construction of the original artery, Sorry about that, North End, way back in the 50s. Mitigation, again, to make less painful. One of the great quotes, I wish I could take credit for this one. One of the great quotes uh, written for uh, spokespeople like myself at the Artery was, building the central artery while keeping this city running was not unlike performing open heart surgery on a patient that insisted on going to work and playing a round of tennis every day. 
So you can see why 25 to 33% of the project's costs, excuse me, went to mitigation. That includes utility, utility relocation uh, to keep traffic moving. You can see uh, a huge crane being penned in near South Station and that small little hole in which all the equipment, all the supplies and the workers had to come in and out of that small little space. Um, that meant more time to do everything. Every linear foot of project that if you were doing out in the middle of Kansas would cost a whole lot less, cost a whole lot more here in Boston. Now, as to the real trick behind what makes this central artery project actually work? How do you keep a six lane elevated highway and the surface streets all operating while you build underneath an eight lane highway? I'm gonna show you how they did it. It's kind of a refinement of the original Bill Reynolds idea. What you first have to do is build walls underground. I'll show you how they did that in a second. <clears throat> and again, you can't just dig the ground up because you have to keep these streets open. So I'm gonna show you how they built these walls while keeping everything open. But once you've got these walls into place and you put these I-beams in between the walls and then using a connecting series of other beams and you put your artery on top of this beam construction, notice where you don't have the underpinning, the force, the weight of the artery goes straight down into the ground. You dig a tunnel into that, it's gonna collapse. Now with the underpinning, the force from the artery, all that weight gets diffused through the I-beams, from the I-beams down into what are called slurry walls. And here's the trick to building a slurry wall. What you have is a uh, slurry, which is a, a very thick, viscous material. You're digging down into the ground while pouring in this slurry. The slurry, again, it's very thick. It prevents the walls of this, of this wall that you're building, this hole that you're digging from collapsing in on itself You insert a steel cage, a steel reinforcement on the side of the walls, and then you pour in your concrete. What's really neat is as you pour in your concrete, because it's heavier than the slurry, it displaces the slurry, which gets sucked up by another uh, truck and it gets hauled off and actually gets recycled to be used again. When you're done, you have an underground slurry wall, which is strong enough, as you can see, to hold up the elevated artery. And there you see it. This is very cool. This is kind of like, almost like we did a cutaway section for everybody. Here's your slurry wall. There's your underpinning leading from the artery down into the slurry wall and leaving enough room underneath where we could build our tunnel. Whoops where we could build our tunnel. Um, that, folks, is a genuine Boston blue clay. Uh, my wife will attest it does not wash off easily. <laughs> it's, uh, and this is cool. This is a picture that uh, uh, was taken early in the construction underneath what would become the northbound section of the artery near South Station. Ultimately, 26,000 linear feet of slurry walls, that's about five miles worth, were built one 10-foot trench at a time. Concrete decking placed on top of the roof beams allowed construction and traffic to move on the decking above while the soil was excavated below. Here's another picture, pretty much uh, near the same area, showing us the roof structure in place. 
slurry walls and beams in the northbound section lanes, excuse me, northbound lanes near International Place. Um, and here's my chance to tip my hat to the actual builders of this project. The steel workers, the tunnel workers who are affectionately known as sand hogs, the electricians, the carpenters, the laborers. Well, let me tell you, nobody worked harder for their money in the rain, the extreme cold and broiling heat of New England. And my hat goes out to every single one of them. They did a fantastic job of uh, building this project. Millions of tiles, each individually hand placed along both the north and southbound sections. In this part of the project, one of the off ramps, these are uh, they're almost like jet engines, which instead of building another um, vent building, they installed these engines to force fresh air into and bad air out of these tunnels. In the main section of the highway, underneath here, was uh, the fresh air was being pumped in and would come out through these vents. And then from the top, just like in the Ted Williams tunnel, the exhaust vents would carry the bad air out. Challenges all around. Uh, here at South Station, where they also wanted to build a new transit way, what today we call the Silver Line. Uh, one of the, perhaps the scariest moment, I gotta say, um, when I was invited to go down to the area directly underneath the red line, as the section where they were building this northbound section of the central artery underneath Atlantic Avenue. And here we are, we're in this dimly lit tunnel and just feet above us, we can hear the red line trains pulling in and out of South Station. They were within feet of each other. And then just above that was building, being built again, this silver line, which would also go uh, underneath Fort Point Channel. And again, meanwhile above, everyone's just, you know, going about their business, um, uh, walking around, really not, I think, appreciating what, what the hell was going on down below. Okay. Now let's talk about one of the more contentious parts of the of the Central Artery Project, which would be what the connection would be between Starrow Drive, Tobin Bridge, I-93, and the Central Artery. Now, I, I need to point out, I actually had Fred Salvucci, who was the author of Scheme Z, or the proponent of Scheme Z. I had him at one of my speeches not too long ago. Um, Overall, he gave his uh, stamp of approval, but he did take umbrage at what I said. And so I'm gonna try to incorporate into my discussion of this part of the project, some of his uh, defense, if you will. So here's the deal with Scheme Z. Uh, there literally were 25 other ways to make this crossing. Scheme Z was the one that the Dukakis slash Salvucci administration chose. Um, <laughs> Steve Ellis of the EPA called it, quote, the single ugliest structure in New England. It would require a 10 story high uh, viaduct. And it would also require drivers who were coming here from the central artery to go over the river, around this loop, back across the river, and then underneath into um, Star Drive. Conversely, from Star Drive to I-93 required you go over the river, around this loop, and back down again. The Charlestown community, they were livid. They said that Salvucci's pushed the artery down in Boston only to have it pop up in our neighborhood. And they joined community activists, MIT professors, and environmentalists to fight Scheme Z. And there were threats of lawsuits from, the, from Cambridge and the Sierra Club and all that was going on while there was another election. And in 1991, the Weld administration came to power. They brought the community, the environmentalists, the activists all to the table with the Bechtel Parsons uh, uh, Consortium. And they tried to come up with a new way to cross the river. So. Again, this was only a $400 million crossing. 
And the reason it was going to be so cheap, yes, I just used the word cheap when saying $400 million, but really, when you consider the volume of traffic and the complexities of building in this area, that was a pretty good deal. And, but the, the reason it was so cheap, if you will, was that there were no tunnels. Everything was going to be above ground on viaducts because, and I'm not a topologist, those are the people who study the way these things can connect. There was no way to do this a du without a double crossing if you didn't have a tunnel. And that's why when the project, when the Weld Administration finally announced what the project crossing was going to be, it was going to be a lot more expensive because it was going to have to include two tunnels. It was the only way, the only way that you could make this crossing work without having to cross the river twice. It was the only way to place 14 lanes of, tra 14 lanes of traffic across the river, keep the river navigatable. It would also require a very special type of bridge. One of the first neighborhoods to really see the benefits of the Central Artery Project would be Charlestown. Because before the artery was completed, the Tobin Bridge off-ramps and on-ramps, which had originally run directly across City Square here in Charlestown, were removed, opening up a few acres of land in this part of, of uh, Charlestown. So this was also made possible by the design and selection of this bridge. This is a cable stayed bridge. And it was chosen for several reasons. First of all, by only having two piers, it would impede less the Charles River traffic that was still flowing underneath it. Uh, it also allowed for lower viaducts. Remember the people in Charlestown were not happy with 10 story tall ramps, had more efficient traffic patterns. And of course it's, it's stunning. I mean, it's a beautiful piece of, uh, of, of architecture. It also is the widest asymmetrical cable stayed bridge in the world. It's the first hybrid cable stayed bridge made of both steel and concrete in its frame. Its construction, like so many other parts of the project, required some very, very careful staging. And now I, I wanna say that another uh, shout out to the people on the project, to the designers who figured out how to build things like this bridge and the connection between the bridge and the tunnel underneath while keeping everything else going. Here we see three stages of the construction of the Zakem Bridge, what eventually be called the Leonard Zakem Memorial Bridge, as it's being built into the tunnel while the old double-decker, there's our friend, the 300-foot weave that we're going to eliminate, still in action while that bridge and that ramp are being built. I mean, even before completion, the bridge became a symbol exploited by banks, newspapers, and, and even jewelry stores. By the way, Christian Men spent two years, by the Christian Men, who is the man who invented this cable stayed bridge, he had to spend two years trying to convince the artery that their plan to strengthen the bridge with extra rebar, that's steel bars that would be embedded in the concrete of the roadway, they thought, well, let's add more rebar. That'll strengthen the bridge. He was saying, no, it won't. They went ahead and did it. They had to tear up 400 square feet of bridge surface and reset the rebar to men's specifications. Just don't argue with the guy who invented it. But look, uh, beam by beam, bent by bent, the old elevated artery was eventually taken down, leaving open the promised 30 acres of land. That was the other thing about that EIS. It promised that 75% of 
whatever was left when the artery was taken down would remain as open space. Now I'll do my Bill Clinton again. What's the definition of open space? What is open space? I mean, some say this open area is as bad as the elevated artery dividing the city. So what do you put there? Stores, restaurants, do you put housing? Playgrounds, fountains, museums? How do you create a place that people will want to visit, not just pass through, so that the area becomes part of the city's fabric? I, I'd say in some places, they've done a pretty good job. We know in some places they've actually built housing. Uh, it's pretty damn expensive. I don't think that a lot of folks from uh, the neighborhoods are gonna be moving into some of those places that I see being built by North Station. But some of the um, amenities that they've built here in the artery between Faneuil Hall and, and uh, the North End, pretty nice. And, and they're a lot of fun and there's fountains and it's great to see uh, people uh, using and taking advantage of these open spaces in, during the summer. Now there have been problems. Some have been plain annoying uh, to reduce costs. Remember, we were always trying to keep the project's cost down. Well, Bechtel Parsons Brinkerhoff decided that instead of using a pair of massive slurry walls, they would go with a single slurry wall against the tunnel of the big dig. But if you only have one wall, that led to problems because there were cracks in these tunnel walls. And for years, the tunnel had to be closed down at night while the crews worked to fill, fix, and repair the leaks. But tragically, there have been deaths associated with the project. Uh, in July 2006, uh, Milena Devalier and her husband were driving to the airport when a ceiling tile in South Boston fell and crushed their car, killing Mrs. Devalier. What we came to learn was that this and this several thousand pound tile had been fastened to the ceiling with glue, not an industrial glue, of course, but it was a cost saving measure by the contractor. Her family filed and won a lawsuit against Powers Fasteners and many others, including the Turnpike Authority and Bechtel Parsons. This is, <laughs> I love this picture only because I've, I've heard some great stories about uh, the project director at the time, a fellow named Matt Amarillo, who has um, having trouble getting the attention of then governor uh, Mitt Romney, um, <laughs> who was handed the job of project manager by Romney's predecessor, Paul Salucci. Uh, two weeks after this picture was taken, uh, Mr. Amarillo was out looking for another job. The Globe reported um, several years ago that seven of nine people who were killed in crashes in the Big Dig Tunnel system between 2004 and 2008 died after hitting one of these handrails. The grisly accidents, many of which led to dismemberment, led to the grisly nickname, the Ginsu Guardrails. They are the subject, they were the subject of a lawsuit filed by the widow of State Trooper Vincent Isila who died in 2004 after he struck one of these handrail posts in a motorcycle crash. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the reasons why Fred Salvucci defends Scheme Z, because it's his contention that the sharp, narrow turns of those tunnels that were required by the new crossing, by going underneath the, uh, uh, the Boston Garden, that's what's responsible for these accidents. He said that Scheme Z may have, was not only less expensive, but it was a lot safer. Construction on the highway uh, completed in uh, 2004, and the books were finally closed in 2006. But construction related to, and as a result of the big dig, still goes on. Thanks to pressure from the Conservation Law Foundation, work finally began on the extension of the Green Line into Medford, just one of the many mitigation projects that were funded with big dig money, including the extension of the Newburyport commuter rail line. So now we come to the big question. Did the big dig achieve the goal of improving traffic? Well, 
We're going back a few years, certainly pre-pandemic, when we look that despite the price gas prices and the recession back then, there were a lot more people driving. And this trend, by the way, as any of you who are driving lately can say has certainly continued. Um, those of you who see my talk on Route 128 know of the increased pressure on the road, which combined with the now attractive route through the city has led to increased traffic on all of those roads. And you can see that travel from I-93 northbound Boston from 128 to Boston has almost doubled. So we're spending more time stuck in traffic, not less. And we build it, and of course they came in more numbers than ever before. But interesting enough, there's less gridlock in Boston. And despite the inevitable traffic jams that occur when some knucklehead does something stupid in the tunnel and causes an accident, or when there are multiple events happening at the garden in Fenway or even at the hat shell when they still insist on closing one lane of Star Drive, it is less daunting. Which leads Fred Salvucci, the man behind the big dig, to recently say to WBZ Radio, quote, I get a real kick out of the fact that they've had to put a 35 mile an hour speed limit on the underground part of the artery because it's now possible to go too fast. It didn't used to be possible to speed through Boston. I don't know, Fred, if it still really is, but <laughs> it's certainly uh, a lot smoother, I'd say that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for um, uh, joining us tonight on our trip through time and space and through $22 billion of your money. So I will now turn it over to Sarah and Matt and see if we have any questions. Thank you so much, David. That, that was incredible. Um, there are a few comments and questions so far. Okay. And just to remind everyone, uh, if you do want to add a question, just uh, type it in the Q&A button. Sorry. I, I notice I'm drinking from my central artery tunnel mug. This is <laughs> going with the brand. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, let's here. I'll do questions first. Okay. Um, so what is the expected lifespan of this infrastructure and can it be maintained inf indefinitely? 100 years, 50 to 100 years, and uh, no, nothing lasts forever. Um, they didn't build the pyramids. They built a, a tunnel under a city with, um, with a lot of traffic. Um, I, I, I mean, eventually, Hopefully, there will not be as much of a need for uh, a tunnel through Boston. Maybe we come up with better transportation alternatives. Um, I mean, look what the pandemic has done to traffic volumes. So that certainly puts less strain, perhaps increases its lifespan. Um, but, you know, um, tunnels and bridges, they only last so long. I'm sure they can certainly be maintained and kept going for a certain amount of time, but eventually, you know, everything has to be either replaced or they have to redesign. Um, there was a, a comment, um, it came in earlier, uh, but about the West End that um, mm -hmm. somebody said that it was a Jewish neighborhood, but um, in a ethnic city donated, dominated by Irish and Italians, and then by their opinion, no clout in the uh, government. Uh, well, it was a neighborhood to be demolished. What do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I do. Um, it really, it, it was a very a diverse neighborhood. Uh, interesting enough, the western slope of, um, of the, if you look up Cambridge Street and you go up Beacon Hill, that section was actually predominantly uh, black, even up and through the 1950s. The West End itself really was mostly uh, Irish, excuse me, mostly Italian. Uh, of the 12,000 people who were still there in the mid 1950s, 
there were a lot of Eastern Europeans for sure, uh, but the neighborhood had mostly been, it was mostly Italian at the time. And you're right, it, the, the idea that it had no political clout uh, had a great deal to do with uh, its demise. Um, someone asked, will the North and South rail link ever happen? And was it ever a feasible goal? Oh, so we could sneak that one past you. Very good question. Um, it's not likely that the federal government is going to give Boston uh, about $20 billion more to build this, um, this uh, rail link. Uh, I don't know if you can still see my screen here. Um, can do you see my screen? Let me just do a quick share. Whoops. Do a quick share here. So um, this is a very fanciful map that was made um, a few years ago showing what it would happen, what would be possible if we were to have a north-south rail link. Um, I live north of the city. Those of us, you know, if we live in, I live in Reading, many of you are in Lexington. Wouldn't it be great to be able to get on a train, a single train and go to Quincy or go to the South Shore? Y you can't do that now. Uh, the problem is that the only way, place to build this North-South rail link is down into the bedrock. And that's expensive. Furthermore, then the other really interesting problem about building with bedrock is because it's so deep and they've actually figured out, okay, well, we would have three stations, one North station, one at South station, and one in the middle of the city. And we call it Central Station. The problem is to get that deep underneath the artery, literally, you would have to have your entrance and exit ramps um, about a mile or so north of the Charles River and south of the South Station area. So a lot of land would need to be taken and a lot of, it just would be extraordinarily expensive. Again, having to bore through uh, bedrock to do it. Now, again, I, I say this in 2021, um, the technology that allowed them to build the channel, finally, uh, maybe that technology will get cheaper and more efficient and allow them to consider doing it maybe for $10 billion, who knows, but that's the status. It's um, one of the, you know, frankly, the laughable things that we used to say is, you know, even, you know, if, if somebody asked like you just did about a North South rail link, we would say nothing that is being done today would prevent the construction of a North South rail link. If you had $20 billion. <laughs> uh, another question is, um, or comment, any question, I guess, in one, you didn't mention the rat problem. Is there a rat problem? I'm not no, aware of that. No, that was some st stupid reporter who tried to make a mountain out of a molehill. <laughs> it was ridiculous. It was <clears throat> the, I, I can still see the cover art. I think it was, what was it? The, Phoenix or Boston Magazine or one of those rags and it was it was it was like a Pied Piper thing and they showed millions of rats just descending on the city crawling over the Prudential. Uh, it didn't happen. It didn't happen because the city, uh, the big dig folks went proactively into the neighborhoods and they tried to get people to do simple things like Oh, I don't know. Put a lid on your garbage. Don't throw food out in the street. Um, <laughs> clean up behind your restaurants. Uh, but, you know, and not to put too fine a point on it, but, you know, we've just had a year where we're having trouble getting people to wear masks. They still had some problems with people not doing the basic sanitary things. And so they, they went proactively out with rat poison and it was never a problem. That was just a, that was just <laughs> people just trying. Um, they sold a lot of papers, but it was not a thing. Um, so I'm just gonna ask, answer, or uh, sorry, ask some of these questions a little out of order, just based on sure. relevance. So someone um, had, set, had asked, 
was wasn't there a freight connection between the north and south through uh, the Boston University property west of the city? There are two really interesting things. Okay, first of all, there was a north south rail link. Um, it was Atlantic Avenue. There was a, uh, a, a set of train tracks that ran from North Station down to South Station. And for, for many older Bostonians will remember freight cars being sighted off on Atlantic Avenue uh, while they waited to be you know, transferred between North and South Station. And yes, over on the other side of the city, through Cambridge, there is a, there is a rail line that theoretically could connect up north and south. However, the city is a lot bigger and a lot more built than it was back then. Um, and so the idea uh, of kind of taking that corridor where originally the old inner beltway was going to go, um, it's, it's harder and harder to find space to do that. And again, knocking on someone's door and saying, hey, we're going to take your home or we're going to take your business because we want to build this rail line. Probably not, not likely going to happen. Um, oops, I just, the 9A4, or this is a comment, sorry. Yeah. The 9A4 tunnel jacking ground freezing was a who, what was that uh, referring to? I'm sorry for clarifying. That was that. the Fort Point Channel. Okay. So it was the it was getting the I ninety tunnel extension underneath the tracks behind South Station. Um, there was some instance. This is another question. There were some instances of contractors using concrete that was old and unsafe. Can you give us an honest opinion of the level of waste and fraud that existed in the project? I don't know who it was who said. Um, Hire a lawyer, then hire a lawyer to watch the lawyers or hire an accountant to watch the accountants. Um, I was out in the field a lot because I loved going out and just, you know, putting on the hard hat as goofy as I looked. And, uh, you know, I would watch, you know, somebody would watch a truck being loaded or being unloaded. They would take down numbers. There was somebody watching that person. You know, it's that, remember that great scene in Casino? You know, the pit boss is watching the, the, the dealer and the dealer is being watched by the eye in the sky. There were so many checks and balances. Um, a couple of, you know, people got caught trying to do, you know, uh, something hinky. But it, it, it was it, the massive fraud, the massive. Um, uh, um, I'm going to stop the share here. There we go. The massive uh, uh, corruption. It, it, it wasn't there. It didn't happen. It just, you know, as again, I've explained, you know, there, there, there was never a direct payment from the artery or the project or the state to any business or any individual. That was also part of the, uh, the, the, the ground rules. They could do construction mitigation to help a business, but there were never direct payments. That's my understanding, and that's that's what I understand. Um, there's also kind of related. Um, I uh, this person wrote. I recall concern over serious leakage through the piecemeal slurry walls, mm -hmm. leading to ongoing corrosion and repairs in perpetuity. Uh, has this been resolved or merely yes, no longer been discussed? resolved? Been resolved. Um, they they. <laughs> not caulk. <laughs> That's silly. They grouted. They used a, 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 um, a special kind of grout and they plugged up the holes. And by the way, um, just so you know, underneath the Ted Williams tunnel, just as underneath the, uh, the artery, there are pumps running 24-7. Um, this, this city is built on a lot of mush and a lot of it's, it's a lot of fill. And there's water constantly flowing and there is no tunnel in the world that's built so completely um, sealed that water does not get into it. You're constantly pumping out water. In terms of the walls themselves, they've solved, they've, they've fixed, they haven't solved it, they fixed the problem. Um, 
let's see. Starro Drive gets bumper to bumper traffic during rush hour. Mm-hmm. Would it be possible to build a tunnel under the Starro Drive for an additional lane? Well, again, you have the same problems. First of all, where are you going to get the money? Uh, look at how much, how many years we have spent arguing about that part of the mass turnpike that does that little end around the Alston landing area where the, uh, the, uh, they want to build another train station. They call it the throat. Look at how, many, how long they've been arguing about that and how it's going to impact the Charles River. And do you build it at grade or do you build it elevated? No one's even talking about a tunnel there. Uh, tunnels are expensive and they're especially difficult to build next to a river. So uh, the answer is probably no. And if anybody suggests building an uh, elevated deck over the Star Drive, please don't. <laughs> it's, I'm, you know, Star Drive was built to be one of those leisurely roads that you could take your Model T out on and drive 25 miles an hour if you were speeding. It was not built to handle this much traffic. <laughs> um, let's see questions are just coming in thank you everyone for okay. um, are there any big transportation infrastructure projects on the horizon for the Boston area yeah the throat the, um, the that Alston landing area that's the big one and that's another that's a that's a few bill right there if they ever finally you know get off their tuchuses and make a decision um, someone else asked, uh, as the downtown traffic was uh, lessened, has, hasn't the volume been pushed back towards the suburbs? Yeah, that's what I showed in those slides. Absolutely. It <laughs> takes you twice as long to go from Boston to 128. I know because you know, those of us who live north of the city, it's terrible. By the way, you want to fix something? Let's fix the 93-128 interchange, okay? Because back in 2002, they had a plan and it would have taken 77 homes and businesses and cost $2 billion. But even the substitute plan, the one they came up with two years later, which wouldn't have taken any property, they just the, the political will to spend that level of money after everything that was done in Boston. It's it, I think it's going to take a few decades for that taste to go out of people's mouths. I'm going to um, combine two questions because they're relevant. Um, were any engineering licenses revoked over the ceiling panel disaster? And at the time, this person was working as a manufacturing engineer on products that used epoxy, and it was tricky to mix, prepare at the surfaces and cure. Uh, their last question was, how could anyone justify using it without redundancy to hold such heavy panels over a place where people were? I, I can't answer that question. It was, it, was just, it, it was a horrible, stupid decision. And that poor woman, um, I, I, you know, and I, I, the consequences as to their professional standing, I don't know. I don't know. People make stupid decisions uh, in the interest of uh, saving money and also getting the contract. So. Like the O-ring. Like, like O-rings and, you know, launching in 26 degree weather. Yeah. Um, and so the last question, um, and thank you everyone for writing questions. Um, have you ever given a talk on the history of the proposed Southwest Expressway? No, but that's a great story. Um, so what the, um, uh, what the question is asking is, um, <clears throat> when I showed you that Witten plan, that spoken wheel, you have the Southeast Expressway and one I guess that would be like six o'clock. So over at eight o'clock would have been the Southwest Expressway, which was supposed to, in Boston, connect up with the inner beltway. And those of you who drive 128 south of the city, and then you see you have 95 coming up from Providence and 95 just stops at Route 128. Well, originally it was supposed to go all the way through, through Roxbury, basically up along the area where the orange line extension is today. And that was going to connect up with the inner beltway right around Melnia Cass Boulevard. That uh, actually, hold on just a second. Hold on just a second. There is a book. Hold on. Ah, here it is. Here it is. 
find this book. There is a book. It's called The Rights of Way, written by the uh, late, great Alan Lupo. It's uh, Lupo, L-U-P-O. Find this book, have your library, maybe the Cary Library can uh, order it. It's terrific. And it is a book all about that, it, it not specifically about, but it does go into great detail about how that inner beltway and the great quote from the uh, Frank Sargent administration, when he took all that, I mean, they were salivating all of this federal money to build an interstate from, I, from Route 128 up into Boston. And we just, we said no, we said no to the money. And Frank Sargent went on TV and said, we once thought that highways were the answer to all our problems. Well, we were wrong. And he took that money and he had it put towards uh, the Orange Line extension, which now goes in that uh, depression uh, along that area where I-95 would have gone. So a mass transit alternative to a highway project that never got built. It's a great story. How long it was book. Well, uh, thank you so much, David. Uh, that was that was truly amazing. And I thank you. Um, if you haven't written uh, a book on it, you should, because uh, it would be great to uh, relive or rewatch whatever. But everyone will be able to rewatch this on our YouTube channel, uh, the Cary Library YouTube channel. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Sarah, and the Lexington Historical Society. Yes, thank you very much. Partnering. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I appreciate it. And you have many thanks coming in as well. Thank you both. It was wonderful.